ओके अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल द डिग्नेटरीज ऑफ प्रेजेंट इयर आई एम गौतम बी असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिकल एंड इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इंजीनियरिंग आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम आवर गेस्ट जोसेफ एम गुरु ही रिसीव्ड हिज बीएस डिग्री इन टेलीकम्युनिकेशन इंजीनियरिंग द एमएस डिग्री इन इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इंजीनियरिंग एंड पीएचडी डिग्री इन पावर इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स फ्रॉम टेक्निकल यूनिवर्सिटी कैथलोनिया बार्सिलोना इन द ईयर 1997 2000 and 2003 respectively since 2011 he has been a full time pro- professor with the department of energy technology alborg university denmark where he is responsible for microgrid research program from 2014 he is a chair professor in shangkong university from 2015 he is a distinguished guest professor in huan university from 2016 he is a visiting professor fellow at anston university uk and a guest professor at nanjing university of post and telecommunication from 2015 he became a william investigator by the william fondan which supports the center for research of microgrids at albong university from being a professor he is a founder and director of the center his research interest is oriented to different microgrid aspects including power electronics distributed energy storage hierarchy and cooperative control energy management system smart metering and internet of things for dc and ac microgrid clusters and islanded mini grids specially focused on microgrids technologies and applied to offshore winds maritime microgrid for electrical ships vessels ferries and seaports and uh, space microgrids applied to nano satellites and space professor is also one of the associate editor for number of ieee transactions he has published more than 600 journal papers in the field of microgrids and renewable energy system which which is cited for more than 54000 times he, he received the best paper award for ieee transaction on energy conversion for a period of 2015 14 and 15 and a best prize of ieee ps in 2015 as well he received the best paper award the, to the journal of power electronics in 2016 During six consecutive years, from 14 to 19, he was awarded by Clarivative Analytics as a highly cited researcher with 50 highly cited papers. In 2015, he is elevated as IEEE Fellowship for his contribution as a distributed power systems and microgrids. We welcome you, sir, and I would like to hand over the session to sir, you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and for the organization for this uh, seminar. I'm going to then. Uh, share my presentation yeah this talk is about the uh, dc microgrids i'm going to take uh this opportunity to talk about the state of the art and uh, applications here so here you have uh my email address for any contact and collaboration and this yes, is sir. uh hello, uh, hello. Hello. Uh, yes. The hello? PPT is PPT is not visible, sir. Oh, visible? Yeah, yeah. Just a moment. Sure. Yeah, you can share, sir. Uh, you can share the application window. All right. Yeah. I think we are here. Yeah. Cool, sir. Excellent. Yes. So we are going to start then. and here you can see a little bit the vision of our center so basically we work on different aspects of microgrids planning modeling control monitoring protections uh, decision making architectures and and so on with different uh, use cases yeah and these use cases come from different uh, microgrids interconnected with them what we call microgrid clusters we have also a uh, digitalization digital twins IoT uh, involving microgrids as well, maritime issues, so ships, uh, ports, and finally also applications uh, requiring microgrids in in the space like satellites uh, and and space-based application. This is uh, our team members. So also thanks uh, for all of them for for this uh, work and and building this this center and. and knowledge yeah and here is a picture about our uh, microgrid laboratories so these laboratories allow us to from a, a matlab simulink file or a matlab file to compile it and to extract experimental results so these allow us also to have a lot of collaboration with uh, people that have ideas and we are able to implement these ideas and to test things 
uh, in the real world and of course to discover more uh, problems so we are always trying to uh, see what what happened no? and uh, when when you are integrating this you can see here another picture with a number of uh, converters uh, power electronics converters connected to a digital signal processor and then this is connected again to our computer so if the student just have the matlab simulink file we can compile it and we can test in the real environment with real converters and real smart meters we have also erected a small wind turbine and we have also a photovoltaic systems in a demo house and inside this demo house uh, we are also integrating uh, many other uh, concepts uh, like we're going to, to also install it will be today uh, a fuel cell and uh, battery system integrated with to, to this house one of the things when we talk about microgrids is about ac or dc microgrids yeah and i will say that everything it can be here summarized in the time of uh, let's say the current uh, war nikola tesla said to edison uh, direct current may be fine for cities when the buildings are close together but most of your country talking about united states is empty spaces only high voltage can span the distance so you are not thinking in long term right what this means that in the times of uh, edison and tesla uh, they need to build big uh, generators and and then to transmit the electricity and for that they need to increase the voltage and the way to do this is to using transformers so it was no way that by using dc they could increase the voltage and transmit in long distances right now i will say that not only we are able to do this but also we are thinking a little bit more locally when we think about microgrids so we think that generation can be close to the consumption points and this way it's not necessary that you increase the voltage so it's like i will say back to nikola tesla you are right when you think about big and central generators but when you think that your house can be for instance uh, a productor of electricity then there is no need to pass to ac right so this is basically the here the concept uh, some examples for instance this is coming from japan and this was the sentai project and in this project what they did is to build an a photovoltaic plant together with fuel cells and also uh, some gensets gas gensets and this was supporting one megawatt of loads yeah so we had a, a microgrid supporting one megawatt and this is i think that this is amazing because it was combination of also renewables in a, in an amazing dc microgrid system so you can see it here it was a 430 volt dc microgrid system connected to solar pv connected to some loads connected to the fuel cell and so on yeah and these are some pictures about what happened in the fukushima disaster and you could see that this installation was working three days in island supporting telecommunication so people could call uh, back home and supporting also a university hospital yeah so it's a i will say that is a very good example on how uh, when we have disasters uh, microgrids can support no one of the important things is that also uh, thanks to using microgrids we can increase uh, resiliency so that means that the recovery uh, could be faster and and we could have a better performance than than during this uh, disaster and this is exactly what happened uh, the day of fukushima in which we had during these three days working in island maybe in reduced uh, operation mode it was a lot of loads that were disconnecting but uh, after these three days we had a recovery and reconnection to the to the main grid uh, some other examples it was another past project in which uh there is a data center that has to support su be supplied by dc you may know that data centers are also prompt to go to dc and in that case it was a ups system a conventional ups system the input is in ac so you need to convert from ac to dc connect to batteries dc to ac and then connect to a front end 
going from AC to DC and then having a multiple converter, right? So the efficiency here was uh, improved by uh, subtracting these two conversions. So we just pass from AC to DC directly to battery and then having the DC to DC conversion directly to the voltage regulation modules. Overall, this had an improvement of more than 10%, right? So this also allows us to have intermediate buses. And because these intermediate buses in DC are always connected to power converters, it doesn't matter how, how much is this voltage, it doesn't need a very tight regulation. So this allows us also to, let's say, optimize the voltage according to how much is the load and to reduce the losses. Some tests has been done, for instance, in Intel, and this is a comparison between AC and uh, DC, the same installation supporting a, a data center. And uh, they find out very similar, let's say, uh, outcomes, maybe a little bit low, uh, only 7% of improvement of efficiency and around 6% savings when you go on DC. So this means that maybe DC in data centers make sense if you want to build a new one, but maybe not to retrofit an old one, right? So this is what we can see it, uh, today, how some uh, data centers are just building right now in DC, while still the major part of them are working on AC, right? Uh, if we think about the control, basic control of, let's say, DC microgrids, more than microgrids, we will talk more about DC distribution systems, is that the power converters needs to, as they have to fix voltage, they need to have and output impedance in order to share the, the power and don't fight each other. So this is what we call also droop controller. And this droop controller, we can adjust according to how much is the maximum voltage deviation that we accept, the maximum current uh, that also can provide the converter. And then if we consider which are the errors between converters, then we can know how much it will be the, power, the current sharing accuracy. And there is many ways of implementing this. And I will say that you could, uh, this is some ways of implementing this by, by analog, but we have also the equivalent in digital. And this has been developed on something called also adaptive voltage positioning, which is kind of the same concept of a droop controller. Yeah. So sometimes you can find the same word, droop control, adaptive voltage positioning, uh, or virtual resistance. And in the case of, of a DC micro, it is the same concept. Yeah, just different names, but the same concept. I will say that after uh, this active voltage positioning is more for voltage regulation modules. So very low voltage and very high current. So because of that, uh, we can see also some architectures that has been appear like having DC micro reads and those DC micro you could use hierarchical control to, to regulate them. But of course, each of these uh, units have or should have different characteristics according to what they are doing. For instance, if we have the converter which is connected to the grid, it may change, let's say, the voltage regulation according that if we need some power to be imported or some power to be exported from the microgrid, uh, we will change it. So this way, if outside the voltage it's higher than inside, automatically we'll start importing uh, current or power and vice versa. What happened with the solar and wind uh, converters is that they can work on the, what we call droop mode or they can call uh, work on MPPT and this can be summarized in this curve. So depending on the level of voltage, we can change from droop to uh, MPPT or from MPPT to droop. And this will depend basically on how uh, much is the battery storage. So if the battery storage level is very high, then the voltage will increase and automatically will make our uh, converters, our renewable converters to work as a voltage sources. Yeah, so this way we can limit their injection of power. I think that's very interesting. And, and then in the top of these converters, we can build the typical three level uh, hierarchical control 
that has been proposed for many years, taking the inspiration from big power systems in AC and converting also to DC. So in that case, instead of using a frequency, here what we are using is the voltage. So that's why it's also very important to use this concept if we talk about very small systems. And in that case, we have primary controls like the droop controller, and then we have communications in which we try to regulate this voltage to a certain level, right? Because maybe the, uh, the voltage droop is too much high, so then we have to regulate and put it back again. One way to do this is by using a centralized secondary control, the same way as big power systems are regulating their voltage. We did the same, but with the voltage. Yeah. In that case, uh, we try to compensate those uh, large droop uh, functions. But at the same time, you can see that if you reduce the droop, you can reduce, of course, the uh, voltage regulation, but at the expense of a huge current differences. And of course, if this current is lower, then you could have the absorption of the current by those, uh, some of these converters. So that's why we propose to use also, let's say, more aggressive troop controllers, but then putting in the at the top uh, distributed secondary controllers. So this means that we don't need a centralized secondary control. It can be distributed along the units, and we just need communication between them in order to restore uh, the voltage to the acceptable levels. Yeah, acceptable levels doesn't mean that we are going to be fixed to a certain reference, but it can be inside some limits. Yeah. And it depends, of course, on the application. Yeah, We have some applications, for instance, when we try to regulate voltage regulation modules to a very tight, let's say, a voltage, let's say one volt, for instance, to supply to a CPU, then what is not acceptable is to have this kind of uh, voltage spikes, especially when your uh, uh, your CPU goes from sleep mode and then wakes up and then back to a sleep mode. This is a huge uh, current uh, of, of a high slew rate. And then this creates these spikes. This will basically kill the CMOS of your uh, processor. So this way, if we integrate this virtual impedance, we can just make the voltage changing in harmony with the current. So this way we avoid to have these spikes, but to accept that we have some degrees of freedom inside this tolerant band. Yeah. Another important thing when we think about the tolerance band is like we could use also this tolerance band in order to send signals inside our microgrid system. And this is very natural, let's say, when we have to change from a droop mode to what we call MPPT mode inside our converters. And we could also define levels of regions, but however, of course, we are limited with noises, ripples, and also the maximum and minimum voltage acceptable. So yeah, basically what is very well accepted is to have two states, let's say. One state in which we are kind of, the state of the charge is acceptable, let's say, and the other is when we are almost at the limit. Uh, because of the good things, having group control also with active current sharing, there are also some proposals. In that case, a proposal from Intersil in which they uh, use both concepts in one. So this way you have the good things of group control that you don't need communications. And then you have a current sharing, uh, which is active and very accurate in, in voltage and current. And then if communication fails, still you have the group control. I will say that this is uh, very nice. Uh, and you can see also other companies like Delta, for instance, uh, applying the same in their in their uh, products. And uh, here you can see also the effect of this secondary control. What we said is that we are shifting up these uh, voltage uh, droop characteristics in order to restore uh, the levels of, of our microgrid. Now what happened is one, once we want to connect our DC microgrid to a stiff DC grid, imagine you have a DC distribution system with a number of DC microgrids, then we have to synchronize our DC microgrid with the with this main DC grid. And because here synchronization 
it's not related to frequency, but related to voltage. What we need to do is to adjust the voltage to the same level as we have in the on the distribution DC network. And then we reclose by means of a power electronic system. And then we can start changing the, the current reference that we are going to, to uh, import or export uh, to this uh, this distribution system. So you can imagine that this third level of control in that case is to to share power between a number of of, of DC microgrids. And I will say that's amazing. You can see this is just one test we did uh, many years ago, uh, just using a, a DC microgrid sharing a couple of units. And then here we have the primary control action. And then after a while, we change the load. You can see how it's pretty well matching the 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 load. But however, the, the voltage is just going down and down each time we increase the, the power. So thanks to the secondary control, we were able to restore this uh, voltage inside acceptable levels. And we were also able to make tests to exchange power with this uh, DC distribution bus. So I will say that this is uh, very good. It was a lot of promises going, uh, putting DC at homes. And I will say that basically they are not cost effective nowadays. And, uh, and we made some studies about that. Even though uh, we can see that for some uh, countryside areas, still there are some products maybe trying to put uh, DC microgrids in place, right? Uh, all these things comes from another of our uh, colleagues and collaborators, uh, Professor Kakigano, who uh, proposed uh, a system for DC homes uh, in bipolar, let's say plus and minus 170 volt. And even if the system it's not successful at homes, it has been exported to some areas, for instance, in Finland, in which they have a DC distribution system in bipolar in plus minus uh, 700, 800 volt. So much higher levels of acceptance. And, and that I will say that is amazing. Uh, in Europe, it was also an attempt to, to make it possible with the company RE Bus, but unfortunately RE Bus uh, entered in bankruptcy and uh, it was not possible to, to put their products in the market. So it's just becoming like a standard and I will say that what is technically is very good, the idea, which is uh, taking exactly the voltage as the frequency in big power systems. So once their systems see that the voltage is going higher, then the, the renewables reduce their power. And they have also a, a system of load shedding. So if the, if the voltage is becoming lower, that means that you don't have enough power to supply it. So they start to to disconnect loads. So I will say that that's very nice. But uh, also this is after we made a, another project with cooperation with Japan uh, and also United States. Uh, our conclusion at the beginning, at the beginning of the project was a lot of uh, promising companies going in. At the end of the project, after four years, uh, we saw that at that time it was no, no market for that. So that's the conclusions we have. Uh, regarding ships, we can see that uh, some of them are coming with a more electric aircrafts. And, and we know that right now we have more and more promises of having aircrafts going going maybe to, to all electric. But uh, right now, what we have here is an example of Boeing 787. And here you can see that they have a number of, of DC systems, but then there is a number of DC microgrids, and they are also bipolar plus minus 270 volt on DC bipolar, uh, a number of four microgrid systems. So the idea of Kakigano, I will say that after 10 years, we can see that even if uh, didn't come uh, home, it's right now applied in, in the aircraft industry. And I will say that this is amazing. Another uh, place that also DC microgrids are coming are in ships. Of course, uh, not all the ships are going to DC, but some of them, and, and we can see uh, how it's happening. For instance, we have some examples here. This is a ship with a number of diesel generators, rectifiers, and then we have here uh, the, the inverters connected to the, to the propulsion motors. 
And uh, this is uh, going very well. Uh, for instance, there is a product from Siemens, which works uh, basically for uh, vessels of less than 20 megawatt. And you can see here the example. So we have the port side and also for the board side, uh, the two separate systems, and they are well regulated by a number of converters that they are placed on those boxes. And then we have the, the inverter close to the propulsion systems. So I, I will say that this is uh, very nice. And then uh, the other concept is from ABB, which they try to separate those converters each other, as you can see here. And then they can reduce the losses, but of course you have to increase the, the voltage here. So increasing the voltage also means that maybe you, you need kind of uh, better uh, circuit breakers also. So this is of course challenging. And you can see here the comparison between when we go AC, let's say in ships with diesel generators and directly connection with fixed uh, frequency at 50 hertz or 60 hertz, depend on the country, and then having all the power electronics there. Or when we need to rectify just with simple diode rectifiers, going to a DC bus and then uh, going with inverters or also energy storage solutions here. The good thing here is that these diesel generators are working on the best frequency that the best speed that they uh, uh, can work optimum Why? while in AC they are fixed by the frequency, by the frequency, let's say, of the ship. So then this is a problem. If we are, let's say, frequency dependent, you can see that the basically this is these are the losses or the emissions they are coupled. So you can see that we have one minimum which corresponds to certain power. So for a certain frequency, we only have one possible optimum operation point. While if we just change it by using DC, then we can decide depending on how much is the load operation, which is the speed that those diesel generators has to operate. So that's why you can see how uh, they are reducing more the losses. However, you have to think that also uh, maybe it will be some extra losses due to the conversions. So this is something that is compromising uh, those structures. One of the ships also more attractive to, to make this possible is what we call also the platform support vessels. You know that right now also in the world there are a lot of offshore wind uh, power plants ongoing. And that's why we need also this kind of vessels who has to support those plants with uh, people, energy, food, uh, etc. So all the things that they are they 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 need uh, to support the vessel the the platform. Some of these uh, vessels are also shifting from an old AC architecture to DC also. And uh, according to uh, some studies, in that case, it was a study in Singapore. You can see how when you work with fixed speed, the engine, of course, as, as we saw before, we have only one optimum in a certain uh, power. However, if we work with variable speed engine, so this means working on DC, you can maintain almost constant uh, the losses and very low all the time. So. I will say that this is a very amazing uh, feature. And uh, if you want to see more DC microgrids in ships, also we have the offshore supply vessel called Viking Lady in Norway, in which they also have been integrated a fuel cell. In red, you can see the support, uh, DC microgrid support in 1000 volt, which is uh, supporting the tunnel thruster, part of them, and also some of the hotel loads. So now, so I will say that this is amazing because we have really a hybrid system between AC and DC. Yeah. Another example, it's another project we, we, we have been also uh, collaborating. It was uh, a ferry, an electric ferry in Taiwan. And uh, in this electric ferry, what we did is in collaboration with Pisedo, which is right now a company inside Danfoss, 
uh, to retrofit an old uh, ferry in Kaohsiung. And basically what you have here is a couple of diesel generators, a bidirectional converter, and then we have 750 volt on DC, uh, DC microgrid system, connected to a battery system of around 100 kilowatt hour, and then a couple of inverters, variable speed drives, let's say, with a couple of motors. So I will say that this is a very amazing uh, DC microgrid system, and it's working and uh, in operation in, in Taiwan. Yeah. Some of the pictures, the electric motor, after the retrofitting process, Super B batteries from Holland, and uh, more ferries are also coming in, in Taiwan and many other places in the world. So, of course, when we talk about uh, electric ships also, we have to talk about ports. Uh, more electrification in ships means that we need much better electrification also in the ports, but not only when we talk about electric ships, also conventional ships, for instance, that needs to provide electricity when they are just um, in the port, they maybe need to uh, provide electricity to, to, for instance, freezers and some other critical loads that they have. So many times they are just starting the diesel generators they have on board and polluting all the area. So right now, uh, strong regulations are coming in, in the Nordic countries and many other places in the world. So you can see, for instance, this is one example of a dock station. In, in that case, it's in Rotterdam Island, uh, sorry, in Rotterdam port. And uh, it's, it's to support, let's say this is a conventional uh, ship. And, and just to support the, the, the power there. Uh, we, we talk about uh, medium voltage, so it's, it's an outlet around 6.6 .6 to 11 kilovolt, kilovolt, kilovolts, right? So that is the point. And, and right now, uh, a lot of things are going to, let's say, AC called ironing. And because of the need in DC ships, we maybe may have DC call ironing also in the future, but this is something we have to see. Right now, what we see more clear is that even with AC call ironing, we need a DC infrastructure. And this is because each ship comes with different frequencies. So depending on the count, it comes with 50 or with 60 Hertz. So this means that we need a converter placed and then to adjust the frequency. And then of course we have a big rectifier. So that means that we need a DC distribution uh, system inside, let's say, the port. And also talking about the port, we have also the problem with the cranes. So a lot of cranes, even nowadays, they work electric. They use uh, diesel generators or gensets to provide electricity. And this is becoming a big problem. Uh, if we want to think that our system, for instance, can uh, flip, up and down containers. When the container goes down, your motor becomes a generator. And right now, nowadays, all this energy or electricity generator are just burning in uh, dummy resistors. So one of the interesting things will be, for instance, to use energy storage or to use the electricity that we generate inside ports. So if we connect with our electric infrastructure, someone else will use it back. And this gives us more than 45% of energy recovery according to the studies. Uh, so, and at the same time, we can reduce as well the peak of uh, power. So the, the connection also of power needed from outside will be reduced. So we are talking here about losses and also economic visibility. All right, finishing with the Earth, we are also looking at microgrids on nano, also on, on satellites. In that case, for instance, we have nanosatellites or cube satellites, and we are also collaborating with uh, companies, in that case it's GOMSpace, to develop new generations of microgrids that support having you can imagine you have a, a number of photovoltaic panels, you have uh, batteries, and, and you need to support 
let's say, communication, cameras, and many other electronics. So this is a very changeable load. And also we have cosmic radiation here that may impact not only our uh, digital signal processors, but also the power electronic systems. And uh, it's going to be very worthy to, to study how those cosmic radiations can uh, affect uh, those systems and how we can uh, get rid of that. So that's all from my presentation. And I would like to, to finish with a sentence from Thomas Edison. He said, talking again about AC, I have always consistently opposed high voltage and alternating systems of electric electricity lightning, not only on account of danger, but because of their general unreliability and unsustainability for any general system or distribution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, wonderful. Thank you for this wonderful session. And uh, I would like to welcome our HOD, ma'am, to this session, sir. Welcome, welcome you, ma'am. And uh, we have a few couple of questions from the viewers. That is, uh, sir, uh, a question is there regarding that is DC microgrid a part of a smart grid? Depend on how you define a uh, smart grid. So I cannot, uh, uh, I mean, first you have to define a smart grid. So when you think about uh, making the grid more smart, it, it is not necessarily to have DC microgrids. We can have the smart grid without DC microgrids. So, but it could be a part, of course. Okay, sir, and what are the security aspects in terms of uh, DC microgrids, sir? Like uh, cyber security, where, whether the things arises in that way? Yeah, we are doing uh, some uh, research on, uh, on DC microgrids uh cyber security and what we are doing is uh, to develop algorithms that we are able to detect once they pass let's say when the cyber attacker enter inside our system how we can detect just looking on how our dc microgrid behaves yeah so this is one of the aspects that we are uh, working on uh, there, there is other aspects also related to computer science that also we would like to, to handle, but right now we are looking more inside. Yeah. And and we have a, right now a, a wonderful PhD uh, project ongoing with that. So I will be very happy also to share with you that. Okay, so yeah. Mama, is there any question? Thank you so much, sir, Professor. Joseph, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So thank you very much for being the speaker for uh, today's uh, webinar and uh, throwing more light on microgrids. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. OK. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you for being a part of this webinar, sir. And uh, we will wind up. This. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, great. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.